Tonight's event is a discussion of the book No Matter How Many Skies Have Fallen by Ken Wapol. Ken is the author of books on architecture, landscape and social history from a radical perspective. And he's going to be in conversation with Anne Johnson. Anne grew up on Candy Island and has known Ken for quite some time. Um, so it's wonderful to have both of them in conversation. And they share an interest in history from below and this sort of radical understanding of the past. Um, Anne is a trained English teacher and has run the Everyday Magic program in primary schools since 2002, as well as developing children's programs for the City of London Festival, Imagine Children's Literature Festival, at the South Bank. And she's written a book with a fellow storyteller called London Folk Tales for Children, which is published by the History Press and is the author of the forthcoming London River Tales for Children, which will be out next year. There's a Q&A box at the bottom of the screen, and we'd ask for you to put all of your questions in there just to make it easier to keep track of the discussion. But there's also a chat function if you want to just chat with the other people who are here. And I'll post links for things like how to buy the book through our website and that sort of thing. Um, we can't see you. You can ask anonymous questions if you would like, and you can upvote the questions asked by other audience members as well. And with that, um, all of our housekeeping is done. And so I will now hand over to Anne and Ken. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alice. Thank you. Well, I'm de delighted that Ken asked me to introduce him because, as Alice said, we have known each other a very long time. And um, I was very grateful to have met Ken at Centreprise because I had been working as an English teacher in Southall and begun getting my young one's writings printed out and distributed but wanted to do more. So I started something called Commonplace Workshop. But when I met Ken at Centerprise, I realized that this could be a much, this could be part of a federation of groups like mine across the country. So that was great. And then I realized that um, we share the history. Um, Ken's family came from Leytonstone to Canvey Island in it was 1950, was it? 1950. Yeah. And, um, and luckily, luckily they moved from Canvey Island a few months just before the great flood of 1953 because their little house was just below the sea wall and that might have been terrible because 59 people died on the island. We lived on the island, but on something which was slightly higher ground, so we were evacuated. So that, that connection between London, East London in particular, and Essex um, is something that Ken's always been, always written about. And when he became um, a publish, the, the publishing worker and oral historian at Centerprise, he, he, he really focused on that history from down under, from, from below rather, history from below, and promoted the poetry and prose of local people. And so the right, Worker Writers and Community Publishers was founded in 1976, and I was delighted that Commonplace could be part of, part of that. And then another collaboration we had was a young teacher, Blair Peach. He worked at a school for delicate children, Phoenix School. And when the National Front marched into Southall, we were there to, to try to stop them. Blair was there also. And he was killed by the Metropolitan Police's Special Patrol Group. And we wanted to remember him. And Blair had always printed, had printed out his young children, his children's writings from the Phoenix School. So we put a selection of them together and put that out as, um, what did we call it? Phoenix Dreams. And, um, and so the collaborations have continued over the years. But I would, um, but I would really like um, to listen now to Ken talking about that symbiotic relationship between East London and Essex and about 
those brave people who started the community of Freighting Hall Farm, thinking there was a new way, another way to live. They, there was people who'd been through wars. I do remember Doris Lessing writing about her father's death. And she said they should have put on his death certificate, cause of death was the Great War. And there, there was, so people who lived through the First World War, the between the wars, the Second World War, or experienced the hardships of living in London, blitzed London, poverty-stricken London, I felt there must be another way of living. And that um, is, is what I would like to listen to Ken speak about. Over to you, Ken. Well, thank you very much, Anne. And uh, I'd like to echo Anne's feelings that um, we have actually, well, I can name the years. I mean, we have actually known each other for more than 40 years, apart from sharing this um, uh, childhood in Canby. And I think once, if you spent any time in Canby as a child, it was a kind of pioneer territory, mm -hmm. mostly self-built houses, unmade roads, chaos in, in many other ways, mm -hmm. and, and very self-sufficient. Um, it kind of marks you for life. Um, you realise that people, whenever there are real difficulties, people will try to find a way of helping each other get through it. And uh, I think that's um, something that I've always admired. Um, I'm especially pleased to be doing this talk for Houseman's Bookshop because um, Houseman's and the Freighting Hall Farm actually share almost exactly the same parentage. Now, Houseman's was set up in uh, 1934 uh, as by the PPU, or rather the P Peace Pledge Union was set up in 1934, which brought together the very growing and large pacifist movement in Britain uh, following the First World War. And, um, and it was one of those people who, who it was the PPU who actually set up a bookshop, um, which eventually transmogrified into the house and bookshop we know today. Um, and the other, apart from having both Freighter Hall Farm and Houseman's having one set of origins in the Peace Pledge Union, the other thing as they shared is they both had Vera Britain as a director of a um, company limited by guarantee, i.e. a charity. So that, and I, I think that's an astonishing coincidence that Vera Britton sat both on the, the management of Houseman's and she sat on the management of Freighting Hall Farm. Now, Freighting Hall Farm is the subject of the book, although it takes place within this wider movement, especially in the 1930s, of pacifism and pacifism trying to find a way of establishing a kind of relationship with the wider body politic or with the wider public, not simply by being refused nicks, but by going back to the land as a way of saying we can do we can live up other ways, we can help people in other ways, we don't have to pick up guns in order to do so. Now I've always been very interested in alternative communities. And in fact, as Anne said, I mean, that's the thing that I've made my major, um, fun, uh, major focus of study over the last 20 years. I suppose possibly I, this began on Canvey Island, which um, had several very eccentric places uh, where, where people from the East End, poor people from the East End could go and stay to recuperate. One was called Hotel Ozonia, which was a Tito hotel, a very strange kind of fairy land a building designed by a Swedenborgian architect whose uh, bedroom walls were decorated with paintings showing the perils of alcohol, with snakes writhing around the bedhead. Um, and the other place was the girls' bungalow set up by a woman trade unionist in London for young women in the rag trade in London to go and have a holiday. By the sea. And there are lovely old photographs of that bungalow with its very extensive veranda set in an orchard and the young women are there looking a bit like a scene from a Chekhov play, they're all wearing long dresses. But that kind of connection between the poverty of East London 
and the desire for social reform all extended endlessly into Essex, whether through the form of land colonies, whether it was the Salvation Army, whether it was the West Ham Methodist Church, whether it was other or political anarchist groups. There's always been that relationship between radical ideas in London and them being able to find a place in the slightly more remote coastal areas or riparian river, riverside or estuary areas of the county of Essex, which is often much maligned, but has an extensive and rather wonderful uh, set of places where you can really hide away from the world. Yeah. I'm also grateful to uh, Brookshop Housemans because just uh, five weeks ago, a good friend of mine, the broadcasting historian, Andrew Whitehead, presented me with this book. It's called Community in Britain, and it tells the story of the 1930s pacifist movement and its communities. And he bought it secondhand in Housemans five weeks ago on the bargain shelf. And that's another good reason for always going to Housemans because they have fantastic uh, old left-wing bookshops or radical bookshops or anarchist book, books, books um, which you can always find something really interesting. So the my... My particular interest in the freighting story started when I contributed an essay to uh, a book called Radical Essex. And again, I'm going to show it there. It's there. Uh, and Radical Essex was based on an exhibition um, at a gallery, um, focal point gallery in South End in 2017, which collected the history of all, many kinds of radical innovations in the county of Essex in the 20th century whether it's welfare reform, whether it's the artistic side, whether it's back to the land or whatever. It was a fantastic exhibition, their most popular exhibition ever. And they collected a book together of essays about the architecture of Essex, its kind of mod modernist impulses, its industrial working class and trade unit history. And I contributed the chapter on alternative communities which actually, if you're interested, the Americans call intentional communities. That is to say, groups of people who share a common set of beliefs and they want to live, uh, not separately from the West of the Pond, but they want to live together in some way and work and live productively and if possibly, self-sufficiently. Um, and so I gave this talk at uh, the Essex Book Festival on alternative communities um, in Essex in uh, 2019, actually, at Colchester, in yet another gallery, in the first site gallery. And I mentioned freighting because I said I didn't know anything about it, but it, I'd heard that it had been the afterlife somehow of the rather more famous Adelphi Centre, set up in 1934 by another peace, and that was also a peace pledge union project as well, set up by the poet Max Plowman, the pacifist and the literary critic John Middleton Murray. But essentially, eventually it became a kind of a socialist education centre and a small holding. Uh, and with visitors like George Orwell, obviously Vera Britton, a number of um, Marxist philosophers, and also East European uh, Christi Christians, radical Christians and American. And famously, the big summer school in 1936 is referred to in many, many books of the, about the 1930s, because it did bring together some of the most influential philosophers in Europe and America at this small place uh, just near Cold Street, Langham. Well, Langham uh, didn't work out. Uh, what they, and eventually they decided they turned it into a hostel for young refugee children, Basque children fleeing from the Spanish Civil War after which it became a kind of hostel for, and then, then uh, a refuge for children from East End of London who'd been bombed out of their homes. But a small group broke away in 1942 uh, to set up their own farm at Freighting, which was only about nine miles away. Very tiny, small, tiny village, and the farm was 300 acres with a church at the bottom of the kind of farmyard, so to speak. And they managed to put, uh, get together £9,000 uh, either through their savings or through one or two 
benefactors, including, of course, Vera Britain. And they set to, to establish this working community. There was one very, uh, they were all important figures, of course, but one um, rather charismatic figure that is really central to the story of Raising Hall Farm is a man called Joe Watson. Now, Joe Watson had been a, a blast furnace man in Concept Steelworks in the 1920s. But when John Middleton Murray and, and also D.H. Lawrence actually set up the magazine Adelphi, which was a socialist and pacifist journal in 1923, uh, Joe Watson and quite a few, he said, still workers and miners in the Northeast took to it very enthusiastically. Um, some of them, like Joe, were actually quite convinced Christians. They were both Christians and socialists. But they thought the Adelphi really was a very, very interesting magazine. And it, it, was, a, it was very much embodying these ideas that there is a better and new life to come. Partly, they got some of these from Lawrence, some from Tolstoy, and some from Marx. But they definitely really had kind of created a sort of compound that was very strong um, and powerful in uh, motivate, motivating them to set up this farm. Um, and I said that, you know, Essex has been this um, kind of laboratory for new ideas because um, Tolstoyism came to Britain and Tolstoyism along with Tolstoy and Lawrence, I now realise, looking back and look, reading all these letters and all these biographies, for many hundreds, of thousands of young people in Britain in the 1930s, Tolstoy and Lawrence were the key people who had a vision of a better life and a different way of living. Um, and it's interesting that Tolstoy, Tolstoyism arrived actually in Britain through another small farm in Essex of Purley in the 80s, came over from Russia and set up a commune there uh, to promote Tolstoy and ideas. So the farm, Joe Watson, as I say, he'd left school at 12. He was self-educated. He actually ran a Shakespeare reading group at the Concept Steelworks uh, in his life. And um, he was very close friends also with the miner who became a very famous writer, Sid Chaplin. And I've got um, here's a, a short couple of sentences written by Sid Chaplin about his memory, uh, uh, what he remembered of um, Joe Watson. J.H. Watson was born at Wall's End on Tyne in 1902 and left school at 12. He worked as a shop boy, a driver and stableeman, a blacksmith striker, and went to sea at the age of 16. He fired boilers and worked in the steel rolling mills at Concept until 1921, and after as a blast furnace man with long periods of unemployment. Well, Watson had this kind of tremendous, kind of rugged, uh, independent, uh, committed approach. Uh, he was he here worshipped uh, Middleton Murray, and in 1940, when it was clear that the Adelphi Centre wasn't really working, Middleton Murray called the only person that he thought might be able to rescue them, and he asked Joe Watson to come down and take over the management of the Adelphi Centre. Watson came down with his family in 1941. He realised it wasn't going to work. Uh, he, he fell out with John Middleton Murray. And in fact, the farm was actually taken over by the Ministry of Defence for it was going to be developed as an airfield um, because it was already in, in the middle of the war. And it was Joe Watson who led the group to Fraising Hall Farm. Uh, it's, it's very difficult really to kind of separate how the farm worked from this charismatic person. And I think it's also very, uh, it was very difficult for me really to, you, to separate their socialism from their Christianity. I think their Christianity uh, in some way acted as a glue that other, uh, just uh, politics alone kind of com communal efforts didn't work. Uh, for example, they, the whole, the farm was run in this, with this kind of um, calendar 
the festivities. I mean, they were always celebrate. Obviously, they celebrated the harvest, but they celebrated all kinds of um, uh, activities on the farm, the naming of animals, um, having visitors, uh, providing a home to refugees, and including several German prisoners of war. They were very active in this kind of conscience driven way to make their peace, not with each other, but also with their neighbours, because initially other farmers in the area were very uh, resistant, uh, very disapproving of the idea of conscience objectors, uh, the conscious as they were called. Um, but, and one of the people who went there, but the, um, eventually there were 50 people living and working at Freighting within 18 months of them arriving there in March, 1943. One of whom was actually the young Shirley Williams, uh, Vera Britain's daughter, as, as we now know, or we do always knew. Um, and she went to live there and work there as the second cowman um, uh, in charge of the animals. Uh, and she admitted at some point in her one of her one of her two autobiographies that actually she not only loved the farm but she actually rather fell in love with Joe. What's I mean? It was a kind of juvenile. Uh, fascination. I mean, he was twice her age, but she could see that he had this tremendous kind of energy and charismatic personality. Um, but on, on the, 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 the this Tolstoy and Lawrence thing, I, I, you can't actually overemphasize it. I'm going to read a couple of things about this um, from the book, which is, you know, how, no matter how many skies have fallen. Um, this is a woman called Kate Weaver who grew up on the farm. I'm, I'm in regular contact with her. And by the way, I told, said that when the two women came to the talk I gave, and they invited my wife and I afterwards to meet, to go to the farm and look at it. But then they put me in touch with about a dozen people who'd grown up on the farm. And one by one, I traced them and interviewed them all. So the book is actually a composite of all their recorded memories the letters they lent me, the photographs they lent me and or shared with me. And so, so kind of, as Anne was saying, I mean, we were, you know, in the 70s, we became very excited about the notion of oral history and writing and producing history from below. And in a way, in this kind of rather late period of my life, I've gone back to that and find it even more exciting than ever, simply recording people, you know, how they've interpreted their lives in the world seems to me a tremendously powerful way of documenting what's going on in the world. So uh, Kate Weaver um, was a, a young girl and she said, um, while I was at, still at school, um, I became very interested in the background to freighting, where her parents had actually given birth to her and brought her up, to try and make sense of who my father was. So I asked him various questions. And he gave me a list of books, which led me to D.H. Lawrence and Tolstoy. He did it in a very subtle way. He gave me the letters D.H. Lawrence when I was ill on holiday once. I was only about 12 or 13. And this was a way of saying you can write letters in a different way. So I read an awful lot of Lawrence. Now, we kind of, unfortunately, Lawrence's reptiles have been besmirched for, from various angles. And people think that he's just, you know, is just someone completely obsessed with sex. But I think we, he's now going yet through a yet another re-evaluation. And I think the poetry, the letters, the short stories, the travel writings are still phenomenally powerful, st still phenomenally original. And at their heart is this idea that we could live differently. We could live better life. Um, and on that, in that sense, Joe, uh, Joe Watson, uh, in one of a short essay he wrote for the London magazine, said, um, D.H. Lawrence has meant more to me than any other man except Jesus. I mean, <laughs> that's quite a, a statement to me. So um, this group of people which grew and grew, and over the, including during the holidays and the harvest times, there were dozens, if, and over the 
11 years of existence, hundreds of people came and visited and were looked after and helped with the harvest. A lot of musicians, nearly all of them, of course, pacifists. Um, and uh, it became a very creative place. They had a building team. They obviously, they worked far, the farm event, eventually made a profit. Um, and it became this very, very established community with its own theatre group, its own choir, with its plays in the barn. And it was a really um, very impressive kind of achievement. But these things don't last forever. And in 1954, some people wanted to leave. Uh, their children have grown up, perhaps. But they realised they couldn't leave because having put money into it, they, the only way they could get the money back was if the farm was sold. And this created a real, well, it was a, to do, under capitalization, really, right from the beginning. They just didn't have any spare money. And the only way the farm could be rescued was if someone bought it out. And luckily, one of the people there had enough money. He was a Quaker with uh, family money, and he bought the farm, which he then bequeathed to his stepson, uh, who uh, arrived at the age of four and is still there um, 73 years later running the farm. And it's because the farm has stayed in the hands of one of the original people there and who, who stayed true to its memory. I mean, that's the great thing. They're enormously proud of what their wonderful history of Freighton Hall Park. So when they invited me to tea and showed me these things, it wasn't they were embarrassed about this radical history. They were just so proud. And all the people I spoke to were so proud of what their parents had done. So I'm going to read two short little extracts um, now. One is from one of the visitors, a woman called Mary Duncan. And uh, she worked, she lived in Blackpool. She was a pacifist and she used to come every summer to Freighton. And she wrote me this letter. Uh, about her memories of it. And she's 93, by the way. I suppose the first thing to be said about freighting was the sense of freedom. It was everything that Blackpool was not. Empty, peaceful, pretty. I love the old farmhouse, which in my memory was not very near to any other habitations. And it conveyed a sense of space everywhere. The days were full of variety. And variety in that context is an aspect of freedom. The main job was to bring in the harvest, building the sheaves into stooks as they were thrown out of the binder. All this done by hand, of course, in those days. Um, in all of this, there was a lot of tomfoolery and a sense of working on the harvest field together. I do not remember any serious quarrelling. There were arguments and disagreements about work, say, or at table about belief systems, convictions, or other people. Folk could be trying, even critical but always interesting. United in their attitude to war, they were free to be themselves in community. There were spats and fallouts among us, but in our leisure hours, harmony prevailed. We used to sit together in the drawing room if nothing else was going on, reading our books, George Orwell, Herbert Reed, Reinhold Niebuhr, or something a bit lighter. This is a rather rosy account, and as I was only around in the summer, an incomplete one, but I remember a sense of family, the connectedness of people, which was a fundamental aspect of the community. People who were thoughtful, responsible, caring, often merry. But all of them, as I recall, were serious people, people of conviction and humanity. And I'll just show just a few slides so you can get a picture of Freighting Hall Farm between 1943 and 1954. So there's the farm. Can you people see it? Can you see it, Anne? Yes, I can, yeah. Good? Yes, yeah. Uh, so that's, that was taken about 1948. And that little boy there standing looking at the hay wagon is Martin Thomas, who is still there uh, 74 years later. Wow. <laughs> that was the building that the Adelphi Centre used, which was bought by the Peace Pledge Union um, in 1934, actually, 
It was an old mansion house and it was intended to become an education centre uh, and a, and a self-sufficient small holding. Uh, that didn't quite work. But as I say, uh, in 1937, they made it available to refugee Basque children being from the Spanish Civil War. Then it became a place of uh, evacuees or refugees from the Blitz. And then it was sold to the Ministry of Defence. And freighting here is on the map. It's uh, near Colchester, between Colchester and the sea. It's a tiny village. I can't move it. Uh. Oh, I can, yeah. And there's the farm with all the fields, which are still there. They haven't been ground down and turned into one vast prairie. There are some people on the sorting out the potatoes. And there's the church in the background, which stands at the edge of the farm. There are all the children of Freighting, and at least um, seven of those I've interviewed who are still alive and there I've interviewed them. Mm -hmm. That's the farm from the rear, and that's the big, uh, that's the freighting hall to the right. And there are the cows that um, Shirley Williams looked after. And that is Shirley Williams on the left of the potato planter. And on the right is a woman called Helen Johnson. She's a, this picture is on the cover of the book and um, five weeks ago I, I had an email from a man saying I bought your book and by the way that, that I, that's my mother on the cover mm -hmm. and he said um, I've got 14 letters that she wrote while she was at freighting to her fiance would you like them? and he, scan, he kindly scanned them for me and I've got this tremendous uh, collection of day by day kind of accounts of the work, the conversations, the discussions, the going swimming, the cycling round in the countryside around it, which I've yet to find a home for. Uh, this is the choir which met in the barn um, and the toured local villages doing choral concerts. And we, we see there the back of um, the formidable Joe Watson form of blast furnace, blast furnace. And I, had, I was inundated with letters from people, which I really had to, and you can see Peace News in the top there. Um, they were all letters from John Middleton Murray to Joe Watson in the course of the handover of the, of the assets. And that's the cover of the book. And again, you can see Shirley Williams on the left of the potato peeler. And it was, a, in my way, a feeling of a long-standing debt I owe to the wonderful historian who was at Ruskin College in Oxford, Rash Samuel, who in the early 1970s created the History Workshop movement, which kind of radicalized and energized lots of us teachers to get back to um, the source of where all knowledge comes from, the people. So that, thank you very much. Um, I hope we can, there may be things we can discuss on that basis. Yes, definitely. Yes. But um, what, one of the things that strikes me when you're talking about um, Joe Watson, um, his Christianity and his pacifism, um, reminded me of, um, I think it was, yeah, Thomas Paine was saying, the world's my country, all mankind are my brethren, and to do good is my religion. And um, it, so the people that were freighting, it, it wasn't so much, it didn't matter too much what their belief was, it's how, what they did, wasn't it? How they, how they, how they behaved towards each other and how they, how they, what they wanted to do in the world, do, do good rather than 
be kind and wanted to be kind and be useful. That's right. I mean, um, and it's interesting that this goes back to what the, when, what the pacifists realised, that if they weren't to just simply look as though they were uh, refuseniks, so mm. to speak, they would, do so, they would do something different, which was... And, the, and there's quite a lot of writing now coming together about the extent of what people might call pa um, the relationship between pacifism and agrarianism in the 1930s. There were dozens, if not hundreds, of rural agricultural projects established by pacifists in the 1930s. And in fact, the, the, um, the actor Jim Broadbent grew up on one that was actually related to the Adelphi Centre. Oh, he grew it? up on one in Lincolnshire. Uh, but you're right, you see, um, they also were, in, a lot of them, to, uh, the, the, the Adelphi Centre, the Adelphi Magazine rather, that's very important, it was a very powerful educational influence. It was bringing ideas from Russian Christians like uh, Nikolai Berdayev. It was bringing the writings of people like Martin Buber, sort of Jewish existentialist uh, writer. And obviously always there were Lawrence and Tolstoy. Mm -hmm. And this, it, um, this notion of the new life mm -hmm. uh, is it, so powerful in, in this period. And I think it, I kind of, I think that when I think that, you know, if you like, that the title of the book, by the way, comes from the opening paragraph of um, Late Attached is Nothing, mm -hmm. uh, which is interesting, um, uh, which is this, and um, our, this is, uh, ours is essentially a tragic age, so we refuse to take it tragically. The cataclysm has happened, which is, of course, written after the First World War. We are among the ruins. We start to build up new little habitats to have new little hopes. It is rather hard work. There is no now, no smooth road into the future, but we go round or rather scramble over the obstacles. We've got to live no matter how many skies have fallen. And in fact, one of the chapters, the first chapter of that uh, Lady Chester Lover is called The New Life. Mm -hmm. And this is a powerful kind of organising idea. And I reflect at the end of the book that, you know, before the war, there's Lady Chatterley, there's Lawrence, and then after the war, there's Orwell and 1984. The whole thing has kind of imploded. This high hopes for doing things differently. And I think we're kind of now, at the moment, we're kind of in trying to find our way again Mm -hmm. the ruins mm -hmm. uh, to build something new. Yes, absolutely. I mean, Lawrence's writing on nature was was very inspirational. And um, thinking now, you know, within with schools, which I'm connected with, many of the schools are starting forest classrooms. Um, they want the children to be aware of what nature's around them. They don't want the children to be frightened of things that crawl and creep and furry things. They, want, or they don't want them to be frightened of bugs. They want them to understand um, the connection and that we are all part of nature, that we are just another part of nature. And as far as Mother Gaia is concerned, we're no more important than a worm, really. So we better, we better not be so arrogant and get get ourselves connected and, and informed about nature. So Lawrence wrote a lot about nature, didn't he? And of course, as you were saying, all this getting, going back to the land, pacifism, agrarianism, um, it, it's, um, it, it's so relevant now, it's so relevant. And um, what else was I gonna say? Um, yes, I was, I was thinking, yeah, so Thomas Paine, he was in, William Blake was inspired by Thomas Paine, I believe, and uh, William Blake being another Londoner, who used to go out into Essex, I believe. <laughs> and as did John, as did, as did John Clare, yes. So. Yes, yes, those, and, and then after the First World War, I mean, there, isn't, there wasn't a family that was not affected 
and how could you ever think you had to have you had to create some hope you couldn't believe nobody could really believe in happily ever after but you might possibly feel that perhaps it could be hopefully ever after and so to get back to the land to to welcome to have that international perspective and you were saying that the Adelphi Center had um, children from the Spanish Civil War, refugees, past children from the Basque country, was it? Was yeah, it, it was, yeah. And, um, and then there were uh, German prisoners of war on Freighting, Freighting Hall Farm. Um, so it, it wasn't that narrow-minded. It was that, that it was a, a, an embracing of our, our shared humanity. It was, and, and, and the thing is, it was, all, it was very creative. I mean, which I, I mean, the Adelphi magazine or journal, um, you, know, com, you know, ranged over politics, literature, philosophy, religion, and it kind of tried to find a way of bringing all those things in harmony. And I have to say, I'm not religious myself. I'm not a Christian. Uh, I'm not religious myself. But if I look back in the 20th century at kind of alternative communities or and the particularly successful kind of innovation like that, I do think that you, politics alone is not enough. I think you have to also have a moral or ethical framework to go along with it. Mm -hmm. It has to be a personal morality as well as a political morality. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I'm, I have to say I'm in admiration of the way in which the Christianity of, um, of that particular kind of act of Christianity, that we must do things, we must help people, we must do things better, we mm -hmm. must work together, really was very formidably um, strengthening to the whole freighting farm story. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, and it's also true, I think, of, of um, uh, if you look at the Christian socialism, someone like George Lansbury, I mean, he also was very involved in a number of land colonies, putting unemployed people uh, out from Poplar or the East End into kind of three months, six months breaks in the country. I mean, it was hard work, but, uh, uh, and then of course the plot lands. But I mean, mm. Lansbury was very much a Christian socialist, as was and is the founder of one of the, I think, still most remarkable communities uh, in Essex at the moment, the Athoma community, again, another Christian community set up in 1945 to bring British and German Christians together in the spirit of reconciliation. Mm -hmm. And it's still there and growing out on the marshes of Bradford. Mm -hmm. uh, and they take, you don't have to belong to, but it's a retreat. I mean, you can go there for one night, go there for three weeks, no more. But you meet and you share in, you know, looking after each other. It's self-sufficient, it's not, not on the grid. It's kind of combining a Christian ethos, so to speak, with a respect for the land and nat the natural world. Mm -hmm. So these things, uh, one has to have to say, as a non-religious person, I, it doesn't stop me standing on the sidelines admiring those who can bring those two things together, politics and uh, per a personal morality. Yes. Well, um... I mean, one could, you could say that you know, what Joe Watson said, D.H. Uh, Lawrence was his favourite person after Jesus. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, if you, the life of Jesus it is when I was, I was brought up a Catholic. I'm not a Catholic now, I left the church. But um, the life of Jesus was inspirational, but the institution of the church was not. So that was um, perhaps a, a different... Uh, the difference that Joe Watson may have felt. Um, is, so, um, right, we've got um, we've got yeah. one or two questions coming up. Oh, okay. So, what do yeah. you do? Um, someone says that uh, would it be can to write the name of the existing community in the chat room? Uh, well, I think the one I'm talking about is the um, Freighting Hall Farm. And then the one I've just mentioned, the new one, is the Athona community. 
Yeah, I, I, sorry, it's 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 um predicted predicted Athena, not Athena. <laughs> Typical predictive text. Um, but um, I think that we do have some time now for questions. Um, right. Do we have any? Well, then let's carry on. Um, I've, the problem now, Anne, is that um, I, I, I love writing this book. It wrote itself, to be honest. And uh, and I and then when it finished, the publisher, Little Toddler Books, did such a lovely work, um, job in designing it and so on. Mm -hmm. I thought kind of the project had finished, but as soon as it was published, people began to write to me saying, oh, I've got some letters. Oh, I've got some photographs. Or did you know my uncle was there? Did you? And I have been slightly actually inundated with new material, uh, uh, which I'm not really sure. Um, well, I've, I've got firstly to catalog it. And also a lot of the people um, have asked me if I can find a home <clears throat> for these things. They don't want them to die with them. Yes. So at the moment, I'm trying to negotiate, or, uh, with, for example, with Joe Watson's papers, of which I've now got quite a lot, um, negotiate with Newcastle University Library to create a Joe Watson archive, um, which will actually sit next to the Sid Chaplin archives. Um, but... Uh, I do, there, there were some, I mean, we've, we've been talking about personal morality. I mean, there were some quite interesting moral dilemmas, not moral dilemmas, there's certainly moral questions that I think any oral historian or anybody kind of who's taking other people's memories and almost extracting other people's memories and safeguarding and looking at them. <clears throat> Uh, how one doesn't abuse that kind of relationship. Uh, because I realised um, that by the end, when I finished the book, I probably knew more about Fraser Hall Farm than any one single individual could have known. Because um, mm -hmm. they were children, I'm now an adult. I've, I've seen everybody's stories and records and letters and so on. And most people have only seen their own. And it does put you in a slightly kind of godlike position. Um, and it was for that reason that um, I decided I would call it the story of Fraser Hall Farm and not the history of Fraser Hall Farm. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> and the reason is that I think you have to, if you're, a, you know, a history has to be. Uh, Broad, um, both-sided, um, uh, kind of um, fair to all parties, um, going through the bad stuff as well as the good stuff, and of course historians do that because most of the, most of history is written about people whose lives are already on the public record, whether they're celebrities or mm -hmm. military people or politicians or whatever. Uh, about which all the bad things are already known anyway. Mm -hmm. The fact is that all the people who wrote these letters um, and kept these diaries and whose children generously and kindly and trustingly shared them with me didn't know that, uh, you know, a 77 year old man in Hackney was going to be sitting in his flat kind of reading them all and kind of making judgments about them all. <laughs> so I, you know, I, I, I said, well, this is a story. And I say at the beginning, this is party pre. I, I love these people. I'm, t I'm going to tell their story. Their, you know, um, I'm not going to try to kind of undermine what they did. 
um, uh, because I I believe in them, and uh, and that's a really. I mean, you have to be honest if you are. It, that's why it's a story. It's not a fiction. It's based all as much as it can be on the things people have written. They've told me. I haven't made any of it up. But the perspective, my perspective, is one of support, one of trying to find out how these things, when they did work, how they worked well. Mm -hmm. I do point out some of the different appointments and mistakes, but I'm not, there's no, I'm not washing any, any dirty washing. You know, I'm not displaying any dirty washing on the line, anything like that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's this kind of respect for the material that I think marks the kind of the oral history movement that you and I kind of We've got mm -hmm. some enthusiastic about in the 1970s. Mm -hmm. No, I mean that's uh, that's just as it should be because there's there's no story that where many stories are involved, but there aren't there isn't going to be some conflict and some contradictions, but it, nothing is black and white. It's all shades of grey, um, and. Uh, the, the thing is just to have all the all the strands, all the stories there, which is what we've got in, in that book. Yeah. Um, we have another question with um, about the, were many of the people at Freighting Hall Farm Quakers uh, as tiny minority, but interestingly, the person who actually had the money um, to buy the farm when it was agreed that they couldn't meet, you know, the, their financial obligations anymore was a quake. Um, Derek Crossfield, uh, very well known in the Essex area for lots of kind of um, important housing projects and, and so on. Uh, so, I mean, without him, we, nobody would know what Rating Hall Farm would be like now. Because that, I occasionally do wake up at night, not quite sweating, but you imagine if, uh, if so many of the farms like this, uh, in the, you know 300 acres mixed arable uh, and uh, livestock farms, uh, family farms, so to speak, they uh, they were they would have been sold on several times, and eventually they would all most of them have now ended up in the hands of large industrial agricultural conglomerates, uh, and all those records would have disappeared at some point in that kind of set of transitions. Uh, so, I mean, it, it's, uh, it's just a stroke of luck that the farm remains in the hands of people who were there at the beginning and who are proud of what it achieved. Do we have any more questions? Oh, no, I'm, not, I'm not very good at this. <laughs> I'm looking. Have we another question there? It says number one, but I can't see what it says. Uh, we've got that. We've done that one. Oh, we've done that one. Yeah. 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 And was there, um, was there, it wasn't Freighting Hall Farm, was it? But there was one of the settlements that at one time provided London with most of its salad stuff. Um, oh yes, the well, that, again that was part of that. Now that was a Quaker initiative. Okay. Um, uh, in uh, the Quakers after the First World War set up the kind of small holding schemes around the country, and um, this inspired an organisation called the Land Settlement Association, oh, yes. which in 1932 uh, that was set up in 1932, and one of their largest areas of activity was. A, a near um, near Manning Tree around um, Ardley, and you can still see quite a lot of um, remains of glass houses um, and vegetable beds and flower beds and all sorts of things and, and outbuildings. But at one time, uh, I believe I was told that you know something like seventy percent of London's salad stuffs came from that corner of Essex. Um, so, yeah, I mean, and there are new initiatives in Essex and um, are, are, are running, you know, kind of small holding 
providing food to farmers markets in London. That are, that's a growing kind of area of um, mm -hmm. agricultural provision. But, so people, uh, want, people want to know, more and more people want to know where their food is coming from and how it's grown. Mm. They don't want it to have been flown in an aeroplane across the sea. I mean, the trouble is, I suppose, the supermarkets race to the bottom as far as price, price cutting goes. I remember, I remember, I mean, with chickens, when we were children, you had a chicken for Christmas. And chicken was an expensive thing to have. Um, you didn't have chicken all the time. And now we know what happens to most chickens. It's, it, well, it's horrible. Um, so is this perhaps beginning of a, of, a, of a more decent way of treating our animals and eating more? Is it not? Perhaps it could spread from just farmer's markets. I don't know. Well, it's, again... Yeah. Again, freighting kind of was ahead of its time. They, um, they, uh, the, some of the cows were named after characters. They had names. They were named after characters in what, Tolstoy's War and Peace, from Tolstoy's War and Peace. <laughs> <laughs> and one woman told me that um, she just passed her 11, well, whatever, however she got to Colchester Grammar School for girls, and uh, which was is pretty, you know, um, posh mm -hmm. and um, and about on the third day she came into the class the girls class and was very excited and she told the girls you know they've just named a cow after me That's and the other girls kind of looked horrified like you know, <laughs> why would anybody want a cow named after you but um, the animals were you know retreated treated with respect uh, yeah. again that was part of that kind of I suppose that comes as much from the Christian ethos towards, well, uh, one version of a Christian ethos towards yes. the, um, yes. uh, the animal world. Um, yeah. uh, not all. Um, I mean, that's a, that is, of course, is one of the, the dilemmas of the Christian uh, tradition on, on the environment. It is that uh, for us too long, it's held that man is the master of all. You know? yeah. Yes, uh, yes. holds everything in his hand and uh, yes. uh, and that's it never rec was able to recognize that man is just one amongst mm -hmm. the animals. yes um i'm keen that if we don't have any more questions um, yes. we should uh, begin to think about um closing up uh, yes <laughs> we'd love to have more questions but um if we can't then no if we haven't we haven't no no I don't think we have Ken, so shall we close down? Can we ask Alice to um, kind of um, help us um, come uh, to conclude this? Yes. There you are, Alice. Great Hello, to see you. Alice. Hello. Hello. Thank you so much for such a lovely discussion, and I'm glad that we did have some questions and some comments from the audience. Um, I hope everyone really enjoyed themselves. I have put a link in the chat um, to find out more about what we're doing at Houseman's and a link to Ken's book that you can buy through our online store. But mostly I'm just really, really grateful to both of you for joining us tonight. And thank you so much for having a wonderful conversation and letting us witness it. Yeah, well, thank you very thank much. You. Yeah, and thanks to Houseman's. And uh, yeah, it was great to remember that we both share the same parents, yeah, Freighting and Houseman's, yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Bye for now. Thank you. Bye for now. Bye. Bye.